Hello, I'm Dr. Pierre Simon. Wonderful being back with you. We've been in this series of moral decision making and today we're in the final level, that's level seven of moral decision making, being an understanding friend of God. Now, that sounds like a mouthful, doesn't it? How can I be an understanding friend of God? Well, let's talk about it a little bit. Maybe you'll get a better idea of how you can approach that from a perspective that works for you. I want to remind you, though, that at New Horizons Institute of Counseling, we're for healing, peace, and harmony. Please give us a call if we can help you in any way. Understanding Friend of God is a level of moral decision-making that uh, was discussed uh, and uh, developed by uh, Christian psychiatrist Tim Jennings. And we have gone through uh, six of the seven levels. Today we're on level number seven, understanding friend of God. When reaching the mature moral decision-making level of being an understanding friend of God, love for God and others becomes written in the heart. And I have to say become because um, we don't start off that way. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's something that has to grow. It's something that has to develop. A few people maybe, boom, just happens like that. But for most of us, it's a developmental process just as children develop. The Christian understands the design protocols. And when you think of the word protocols, think of code of behavior. Uh, the, the protocols of God has uh, created within ourselves and, and the environment a code of behavior that we use. And I, when I think of that code of behavior, because I don't like the word protocol really. I, I heard that too much in, in the hospital when uh, my wife was ill with COVID um, and oh, their protocols. Uh, and unfortunately, their protocols uh, made her sicker. And um, despite my pleadings um, for uh, other treatments, uh, uh, and, and unfortunately for me, she left, but fortunately she's in heaven. Um, but the protocols would just grate me, that word protocols, because protocols aren't always right. Uh, protocols, there's human protocols, there's business protocols, there's company protocols and so on. So when I hear the word protocols, it, it kind of uh, gives me a little bit of an angst, but code of behavior, now that makes more sense when we're talking about God because think of the DNA that we have within us. Think of the code, the written code that's within the DNA that they're discovering now in recent years, not possible to have just happened impossible. Probabilities are so extreme that it just can't happen by happenstance. It had to have been written. And now you see the evolutionists talking more about alien creation and this and that because they don't want to talk about God. Yet we've been saying all along, the Bible has been telling us all along, it's written in us by God. Uh, and so his hand had a lot to do with our create everything to do really with our creation, but with the writing of that code that then spread into the developing of our bodies, minds, souls and spirits, you might say, uh, code of behavior. So if you think of it that way, now it, it makes a little more sense when we're talking about understanding God's design within us. That design is special. In fact, God created us in oh, a state of advancement with each creation. In other words, first he built the, the stars, the, the, the sun, the moon, and uh, the universes. Then he built the, the, the earth, the seas, the trees, the animals. Then came human then came male human, the last female human, which is telling us, and some may not like to hear this, but it's telling us if he built us in an ascending order, that means female 
is built better than the male. Uh, I don't, I don't want to think that, but yes, uh, if it's in ascending order and we see that example in the scriptures, more complicated, more special. In fact, that Hebrew word is actually, uh, that's referring to the female, uh, it, it, it talks about engineered with intricacy. Um, engineered with articulation of design and detail more so than the male, more so than Adam. So take that and run with it if you want to. But being an understanding friend of God means we're frequently, if not always, other-centered. So we should be other-centered at that point in this level of our ma developing spiritual mat maturity, emotional maturity, at that level of other-centered, thinking about what's best for you, what's best for her, what's best for him, what's best for uh, the business, the job, and so on, instead of bringing it back to what's best for me. And that's important too. But when we look at it the other way of giving and thinking of others, what does that do to us? I don't know about you, it makes me feel better. Uh, it gives me a joy to realize I'm helping someone or I'm able to do something for someone uh, if I have the means or if I'm able to, or even if I have the energy to. Sometimes I just don't have that energy anymore as I'm getting older, but I sure feel better even if I don't get back what I may expect I should get back still feels good that I've given. And that's something that's written in that code of behavior within us that actually stimulates us, activates the health uh, and well-being of who we are. Uh, it, 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 you could even look at it as it increases your immune system when you're doing good things. The reverse is true. You're doing bad things, what's it gonna do? It's gonna decrease that immune system. It puts stress on the body. And you look at so many people who are very strong-minded and those very strong-minded doing good things, they, they certainly seem to be healthier for a longer period of time than most everyone else and they, they seem to uh, make more out of life, do more, um, that there's something special about that. And those that are takers and mean and whatever else, and uh, they're not as healthy. You don't see them as healthy. You can see they look sickly. Uh, their faces are crunched and whatever else. Maybe they'll live as long, but that's with all the extra care that they have to have in helping them to, because internally, it's not happening that way. We're choosing to cooperate with God in fulfilling His purpose in our life. Not my purpose, not your purpose, His purpose. And how do we know His purpose? Well, you, you're not really going to know it until you read the Bible. And, and that's one of the uh, things that uh, law of, of exercise, the uh, law of exertion, uh, you have to put something into it to get something out of it. So you don't have to, you know, read and memorize, but take some time and start reading the Bible if you haven't read it. I always tell folks, start with the New Testament, get into the, usually start with the Gospel of John. You know, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the synoptic Gospels. But uh, John has his own outlook and his perspective of the way he uh, remembers things and, and ha as he writes Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, take from one another information and then add their additional information to it. So they're very similar, more synoptic in, in that sense. John is a little more um, special in that regard. So I always say start with the Gospel of John and slowly work back and then come back to the others when, whenever you, you choose to. Um, and it's good to refer back and forth because some stories are in one or the other that, that may not, you might not find in, the, in uh, another uh, 
epistle. Take some time to do that. Then get into the Old Testament. Don't listen to people who say the Old Testament's the past and, and don't bother with it. Uh, well, they say that because they don't, they don't understand it. Uh, they misinterpret much of it, and much of it is written or translated from human judgmental law, imperial law perspective. Uh, when you get into the Hebrew and the, uh, and the other languages and you, you look at some of those key words that have been translated more human law type words, you find it has other meanings too. And when you realize that, then it makes more sense. So the Old Testament is important to under, help you understand the New. The New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old. We need both. Now, getting back to, I went off on a little tangent there, a little rabbit trail there. Level one, just as a quick referral from what we've been discussing, level one in the Bible, we see the Jews in the immature level of level one of reward and punishment, in which they're enslaved people in Egypt. Level two, that second level of immaturity in development is called marketplace exchange. The Jews are in Sinai, if you think of it that way and you picture it that way. I remember things a whole lot better when I picture it and uh, I'm a visual learner. So I, uh, it, when I picture it, I can remember it and history was a breeze in college um, because I could see history unfolding in my mind and it made it a whole lot easier remembering the dates and all that because I'm not a memory person. The Jews are in Sinai saying, Lord, we got a deal. If you do for us, we'll do for you. Level three, another immature level of social exchange. Israel wants a king because it's how all the nations govern themselves. That's herd mentality, same principle. It even occurred back then. Even if it takes you over the cliff, even if that herd mentality, following everybody like the Pied Piper and everyone follows the Pied Piper, where does he go? Well, if he sends you over the cliff, you're just following the herd. And then as you're falling, you're blaming everybody else for where you're going instead of taking accountability for yourself. Uh, I should have paid more attention. I should have read more or studied more. I should have looked around a little more and been more alert. Uh, level four is another immature, and it's the last of the immature levels of moral decision-making and it's law and order. Uh, the Pharisees represent that law and order, the Pharisees and Sadducees, unquestionable legislation of rules and codes at the time of Christ. We have a law, Jesus, that you keep breaking. And what did they do? Well, there's punishment if you break the law. Level five, we come into the mature levels of moral decision-making. In mature level five, love for other people saw Jesus demonstrating eternal channels of other-centeredness. Love for others by eating with the tax collectors, speaking to women and prostitutes and healing on the Sabbath. No longer living on milk, the Christ followers became acquainted with the teachings of righteousness, the teachings of doing good, of being good, of following the moral code of God. Level six, the next mature level that we discussed, principle-based living. The Christ followers by constant use are learning to develop thoughts and actions in harmony with God's character of truth, love, and liberty. And if you think about that, the, his character uh, envelops those three main principles, uh, truth, love, and freedom or liberty. That's who he is. And he wants us to be sim as similar as possible, if not be just like him. And he gave us Jesus to demonstrate that for us so we could see him and realize 
he did it. He was God in nature, but in human form, that God in him still, he knew right and wrong, but his humanness had to make choices of doing right and wrong, of following the code of behavior. Transformation and lifestyle differentiate them from that which is damaging and destructive to that which is strengthening, mature, and eternal. Now we come to level seven. The mature level seven, understanding friend of God. The followers of Christ have the parental protection of God. That's you and me. We have his parental protection, just like you would protect your children. In being able to have an eternally close personal relationship with him. Scripture tells us that Jesus said, there's no greater love than this, that a person lay down their life to save their friends. This is the principle of life, the central principle of the kingdom of God. This love is the remedy for the infection that is destroying mankind, the infection being sin. And the infection is this, Satan's wicked disease of survival of the fittest, which is preferring self, self-centered, self-protective, selfish, so much that a person will kill their friends in order to save themselves. You are my friends, Jesus said, if you take my prescription and love one another. Do you want to be a friend of God? Do you want to be a friend of others? Do you really want to be a friend of yourself? Because when you're other-centered, you like yourself more. You take care of yourself more. You respect yourself more. An act of God cannot instantly give maturity because he requires your participation. It's not written in our DNA. That code of behavior is something he just can't build into us because it requires our choice, our free will, our choice to do right and be right. They were sinless and immature before Adam and Eve became corrupted with fear and selfishness. Adam and Eve's lack of involvement or participation in developing the mature character of God left them in an immature state of truth, love, and liberty. I think of that, and I think of babies. You know, our two boys, when they were babies, uh, so helpless, uh, so dependent on us to take care of them, to feed them, change them, and, uh, and, and even smile at them, to, to give them a, a sense of acceptance or feel good or whatever that may have done and they smile back and, 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 and you feel good taking care of your child hopefully uh, and if not then go get some counseling get some help find out what what's blocking that because usually there's something and, and it can be fixed it's fixable but they're so helpless so can babies feed themselves use the toilet dress walk or, or talk no Parents must relate to their children based on the youth's level of maturity. And so that code of behavior that's written into us within that DNA, uh, there's, I think of it as, as a bridge, and we talked about a bridge between knowledge and understanding, which is experience, and that bridge of experience helps us understand more fully, giving us an, another bridge to uh, insight. Insight is being able to predict, to know what's going to happen if the same thing occurs again. Uh, so we're able to predict that uh, if we drop something, it's going to fall. If we let go of something, it's going to fall. Or um, if, if we turn a bottle uh, upside down, the water's going to come out, the liquids are going to come out. We, we can predict that because we have knowledge of it. We've experienced it, giving us a greater understanding of gravity, the law of gravity, God's law, God's design law of gravity. 
and okay, if we do that again, it's going to happen again. So I need to learn from that. And in learning from it, I don't repeat it, hopefully. And if I do, it becomes a reminder so I don't repeat it as often. It's that bridge that gives us that additional connection in our code of behavior that's written within us in that DNA structure. Making that DNA, and I, I envision it in my mind, making that DNA stronger, even perhaps healing in some areas of DNA damage, where when we exercise God's code of behavior, participating in it, doing it, not just thinking it, changes can occur in that code of behavior that brings about a greater understanding, perhaps a fix that is needed in giving us that other-centered ability that perhaps we're not born with. Learning to ingest the nurturing food to develop bodily organs slowly for a child, for the infant, builds physical and mental strength for good reasons, because if it, if, it, if it was too quick, uh, well, it, let's feed the baby the steak. No, no, that's, that's not gonna work because he has to develop. God designed us that way for a purpose, so God's truths and principles become part of our inner workings so that we can stand and walk the Christian walk. You don't, you're not just born a Christian. It's something that's developed. You're not just born a friend of God, an understanding friend of God. It's something that's developed. Just like he designed our bodies to develop, if it develops properly, it grows properly, it becomes stronger, it develops more fully, more complete. As it gets older, we de are developing our minds, our brains, we are now capable of abstract thinking and uh, uh, understanding, and now we've also experienced good and bad, adding to the understanding of things, making us more capable of grasping who God is, grasping that relationship with God. What helped me to grasp that relationship was recognizing that every prophecy in the Bible came true, hundreds of prophecies, and the statistical odds against only 50 of the, the first coming of the Messiah were one zillion, 500 billion to one. And, and yet all 400, it's 380, something like that, all 400 came true. And that's just the first coming. The second coming being in the future, but we're seeing the prophecies unfolding that the Bible describes will be leading up to that point, and plus all the other prophecies that have come true. Well, that helped me grasp that realization, God is real. He's there. The Bible tells us in the Remedy Bible, which is a paraphrase of the Bible, they overcame him by partaking of the remedy the perfect character of Christ the Lamb, symbolized by his blood and by the evidence of their self-sacrificing lives as they no longer loved their own selves so much as to shrink from death. They were healed to love just like Jesus. Don't shrink from death. Basically that saying, don't be afraid. Don't live your life in fear. Well, what happens when you live your life in fear? You're in the basement of the brain. You're in the fear and emotion center of the brain. Not a lot of good things go on down there. We need that. We need to recognize threats and to act quickly. But you know, if we dwell down there too long, fear grows. And fear is like a cancer. As it grows, it kills off things that are around it. It takes over spaces. It prevents the upper room of the brain where your good thinking, your conscience is located, your problem-solving skills are located. 
it slows that down because it's drawing the energy just like a cancer eats away at the body, it's eating away. That bottom basement of the brain, that fear center is eating away at the brain. And the upper part of the brain will actually shrink. They've done research on that. You don't have to take my word for it, but look it up. It, it will actually shrink. The brain matter shrinks because it's not getting fed properly. And yet the fear, the basement center is actually enlarging the matter, the, the dark matter in that part of the brain grows the brain in that area. That doesn't sound very good, does it? Well, I don't want to live in fear, but if I do, bad things are going to happen. My immune system is going to drop, making me more vulnerable for whatever. Um, and there's no guarantees that your immune system is going to stay up there, but in principle, that's what happens. And in the research, that's what they say happens. Don't shrink from fear. Face it. Okay, I'm not going to be afraid of this. I'm going to face it. I'm just going to do it. Sometimes there are things I want to do, but oops, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of, oh, well, what if or whatever, but I know it's something that I should do, that it's the right thing to do. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to think about it. You know, I have to go back uh, for uh, some uh, uh, some testing, um, and, and I don't want to have any more testing. You know, it's a, you know I've had three heart attacks in the past, and so you know they want to test and see how it's doing and all that. And I'm thinking, ah, you know, I don't want to do that. You know, all right, I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Don't shrink from fear. Don't shrink from death. The Bible says the best thing for us is to be in heaven. So if we're out of the body, hey, we're all the better. We're going to heaven. Don't be afraid. Your time's not up yet. God has a plan for you still in this world. And when that plan is over, then okay, whatever happens, happens. But chances are he has a full life planned for you because he has a full agenda on your schedule. Look for that agenda. Find that application that he has for you and be a friend of God, an understanding friend of God in going forward. Life becomes so much better. You enjoy it so much more and people enjoy you a whole lot better also. And may your troubles be more minor, your blessings more and happiness come through your door. God bless. We'll talk to you next time as we get into the next series that we're going to be talking about.